Okay, good morning. Good morning. It is a good morning, isn't it? Yes. We have a great, great group of people here today. I want to thank everybody very much for coming. Uh, we're setting up a pop-up site right here in Rochdale Village, and we want to get the word out. Let's give a big round of applause. We have a number of guests you're going to hear from in a moment, starting with Congressman Gregory Meeks, yeah. who is a new grandfather. Let's give the new grandfather a bigger round of applause. Look at that. We have, you'll then hear from Jennifer Jones Austin, who's the CEO, Executive Director of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. Jennifer Jones Austin has been such a force for social justice in this city and in this state in every way, fighting for equality. Thank you so much, Jennifer Jones Austin. We have Assembly Member Vivian Cook, who has been a great champion for Queens. We have Dr. Jomaris uh, Pena, who is from Somos Community Care. Somos and Dr. Talaj. Thank you, Dr. Talaj. Uh, Kyle Bragg, President of 32 BJ, is going to be joining us. We have Councilperson Adams with us today. Thank you for your good work. We have the head of the NAACP, the indomitable Hazel Dukes, who is with us today. Hazel Dukes is my second mother. I'm always nervous when she's behind me that she's going to give me a little wake-up call. Uh, it's a pleasure to be home for me. Queens is home. Uh, when people say to me, boy, you have a New York accent, I say, I don't have a New York accent. That is a Queens accent. That is a Queens accent, and I'm proud of it. Uh, I have been to Rochdale Village many, many times. Yes. The Cuomo family all was Queens. My father started in Jamaica, Queens, South Jamaica, moved up to Hollis, Queens. That was the entire trajectory of the Cuomo family. It was about three miles. We went from Jamaica to Hollis, Queens. Uh, my first apartment, Sunnyside, Queens. My first house, Douglaston, Queens. So it's a pleasure to be back. Uh, Queens is a special place. To me, Queens really represents uh, the heart of what New York is all about. It's diversity, uh, it's unity, it's strength, it's people who are finding commonalities rather than differences. Uh, Queens uh, people also have an attitude, I want you to know. There is a Queens <laughs> attitude. I have a Queens attitude. Always have, always will. Uh, they used to say my father had a chip on his shoulder. And my father would say, that's not a chip on my shoulder. That's my, my queen's attitude on my shoulder. You know, you grow up in Queens, you grow up in an outer borough. What is Queens? It's an outer borough. Now, there, there is a meaning in that, outer borough. There is no inner borough, right? Have you ever heard of an inner borough? There isn't an inner borough. It's only outer boroughs. Queens is an outer borough. Brooklyn's an outer borough. Brook Bronx is an outer borough. Staten Island is an outer borough. But they called you an outer borough because you were different. The outer boroughs are where the working people live. Uh, the middle class people, the poor people lived in an outer borough. There is no inner borough, but the inner borough was Manhattan. That's where the wealthy people lived, in Manhattan. And when you lived in Queens, the attitude was always, well, why don't you live in Manhattan? Well, because you're outer borough people. You don't have the same level of wealth. You don't have the same level of power. You don't have the same level of resources. True. And that's why Queens and the outer boroughs need fairness and equity and justice and representation to make sure there's equality. <laughs> Yesterday was Easter for those who celebrated. Uh, I celebrated Easter yesterday. I'm a Catholic. Easter is the spirit of renewal. It's the beginning of spring. The Bible says in Song of Songs, Behold, the winter is past. F flowers appear on earth. Song, see, the season of singing has come. 
we went through a long winter, probably the longest winter of my life. We went through the COVID winter. It was the coldest, the darkest, most frightening winter we have ever gone through. People were isolated. People were afraid. You couldn't go outdoors. You couldn't touch. Couldn't hug. You couldn't see family members. You couldn't see your mother. You couldn't see your grandmother. You're afraid literally to see one another. How cruel a winter. How cruel. And then death on top of it. Death where people died in hospitals and you're not even, never even had a chance to say goodbye. People died, you never had a chance to go to a wake. You never had a chance to go to a funeral. It's that they just disappeared. They died alone. And there was no way to grieve. And then there were rumors on top of rumors and, and fears. And it was worldwide. And then this terrible politics on top of it. And who's denying it? And who's telling you the truth? And who's lying? It was the winter of hell is what it was. But to me, Easter says seasons change, and there's a cycle, and things move on, and Easter is about spring and renewal. And as cold and as dark as everything was, then you start to see the flower appear magically from the earth that you thought was barren and frozen. And we are in the season of renewal, and we have to make it a season of renewal. It doesn't just happen. Renewal requires effort. You have to see a different reality and you have to make it happen. And that's where we are now. The Bible says the, springs rain, the spring rains don't feed the flocks. We have to sow what we want to reap. It is our effort. And what we're saying at this point in time, with the spring, with the sunshine coming back, with the flower coming out, we're going to rebuild this state. We're going to rebuild this state, and not just rebuild it. We're going to reimagine it. We're going to reinvent it. We're going to take it to a place it's never been before. When I was in the federal government, I did emergency disasters, and I'll never forget I was in the Midwest of the United States, and there had been a terrible flood. And we were standing outside a house that was flooded, and floods are nasty. They're nasty. You think it's just water that comes and goes. No, it's, it's sludge, and it's silt, and it's mud. And there was a family standing outside the house looking at a house that was basically destroyed, and they're picking through to find belongings. And the father calls the family together, and the father says, See, the house now, imagine what it's going to be. Imagine when we can get rid of that old refrigerator that didn't work anyway. Imagine now we can finish the basement that we never finished. Imagine now we can build a big family room that we always wanted to build. Imagine the renewal and the opportunity that comes in renewal. So we're not just going to rebuild what was. We're working on a plan in Albany now that's going to build a New York that is reimagined, reinvented, rebuilt, reunited in a way never before. We're going to advance this state. Let's take the moment and recognize the injustices that, that existed and correct them. And COVID showed us a lot of these injustices right up close and personal. The inequality in the education system. Now, we always knew we had two education systems, right? One for the rich and one for the poor. Let's be honest. We're in Queens. We can say honesty, candidly. But that remote learning exploded the injustice. Remote learning. Yeah, remote learning works great. If you have the internet, if you have the right computer and device, if you have someone who can help you, otherwise you got left behind at 100 miles an hour, the speed of the internet. 
worst income inequality in the, in the history of this state and this nation. Not broadband accessibility for everyone. Let's rebuild with new airports like the congressman is working on and new trains and new bridges and new houses and new home ownership, new job training that really gives people the skills. Finally, put in the green economy that we've been talking about and dreaming about and everyone's been talking about, but nobody's been doing. We'll do that first here in New York in our renewal. But the first step towards renewal is what? Is defeating COVID. Do not get cocky with COVID. Do not get cocky with COVID. Well, it seems like it's getting better. It is. Do not get cocky with COVID. There are variants. This virus changes on you. It mutates on you hundreds of times a week around the world. All you need is one mutation that is vaccine resistant, and then we have a problem. We have to crush COVID, and we have it on the run. But now is the time that we have to crush it once and for all. And the first step towards doing that is you have to take the vaccine. You have to take the vaccine. Now, there are three reasons why people don't want to take the vaccine. My terminology, not medical terminology. The first is the superhero theory. I'm not afraid of COVID. Let COVID try to attack me. I'm a superhero. Go ahead. I can't be beaten by COVID. Okay, maybe a superman, maybe a superwoman. You can get it and give it to someone else who is not a superhero. So don't just think about yourself. Think about other people. Second theory is the, I'm a scientist. Well, I haven't seen the full data on the effect of the vaccine and until I review the full data of the long-term effects. Yeah. Uh, there is more risk in not taking the vaccine than in taking the vaccine. The risk is not just to you. The risk is you're going to affect your mother, your grandmother, your grandfather, someone else. The third theory is the skeptic theory. I'm part in the skeptic theory. Well, federal administration Donald Trump said the vaccine's safe. That means nothing to me. I'm in that school. We never took Donald Trump and the federal administration's word on whether or not the vaccine was safe. We put together our own New York panel of the best doctors, the best scientists, and we checked that vaccine. And on the skeptics, nobody's asking you to go to first. 10 million New Yorkers have taken the vaccine. I've taken the vaccine. It is safe. We know that. So we need people to take the vaccine. And we have to do it in a way that is fair. Not only did COVID kill, COVID discriminated. COVID discriminated. COVID killed twice as many black people as white people. COVID killed one and a half times as many Latino people as white people. Why? Because the black communities didn't have the same access to health care. They didn't have the same hospital system, the same doctor system, the same primary care system. More underlying conditions. And COVID exposed that discrimination and fed on that discrimination. So when it comes to the vaccines, my point is very simple. The people who should be at the front of the line are the people who were at the end of the line when it came to testing and being able to deal with COVID. And we have work to do. In New York City, population is 53% white. It's 54% of the population that has actually received vaccines. 
The black community is 27% of the population. Only 19% of the people who have gotten vaccines. Latino community, 28% of the population, only 23% of the population who has received vaccines. We are doing everything we can to do this equitably and fairly. We are bringing the vaccines to the black community, to the Latino community, 189 pop-up vaccine sites in communities of color. We're bringing it to black churches, so it's, it's there, and we have the faith-based community advocating it. We're bringing it to Rochdale Village tomorrow with Somos at the Grand Ballroom. Rochdale. We need you to come out and take it. We need you to come out and take it. And we're going to start a new effort today a public education campaign that reminds people that it's smart and it's right and it's caring to come out and get the vaccine. We call it the roll up your sleeves public education campaign. And it's been done uh, with some truly talented people. We have Jane Rosenthal, who is an artistic genius who runs Tribeca Productions. Tribeca helped New York come back after 9-11, if you remember, by bringing people back to downtown Manhattan. Let's thank Jane Rosenthal, <laughs> Charlie King. Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> Scott Burns, who's the producer, who did a magnificent job, and Columbia University. And let's look at the its roll up your sleeves, get the vaccine because it's up to us, and then we'll hear from the great congressman uh, and new grandfather and great champion of Queens, friend of mine for a long time. We've worked together here in New York. We then worked together in Washington, D.C. You'll hear from Congressman Gregory Meeks, then Jennifer Jones Austin, then Assemblymember Vivian Cook, then Dr. Yomaris Pena, uh, and then Kyle Bragg, and we thank you all very much for being here. Thank you. God bless you. I'm getting the COVID-19 vaccine out of fear and out of hope. I'm taking the COVID-19 vaccine because I was fortunate enough to survive it. Trust me, you don't want what I had. No one should have to go through such suffering. I beat cancer twice, and I am a COVID survivor. Our community has been devastated by this virus. The best way to save black and brown lives is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. I'm getting vaccinated because that is the only way we can get out of this moment to show my community that it is safe. For my patients and my family. My wife and our future child. And for my grandkids. All my fellow New Yorkers. It means an awakening for the city that was never supposed to sleep. And I'm getting the COVID vaccine as soon as I can. Because I do not want anyone else to lose a loved one the way that I did. That's why I was vaccinated. I'm getting vaccinated because I'm ready to not be afraid. With the vaccine, this fight can finally come to an end. Roll up your sleeves, New York. We're in this together. Together. together.